Chris Tilly is with us from UCLA. He's the director of the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment there. He's an unusual person with a joint doctorate in planning and economics from MIT. So he comes with really a big literature and set of approaches to a number of these labor topics. He's recently written a book called The Gloves Off Economy, Labor Standards at the Bottom of the American Labor Market. Certainly a huge topic and one where there's a lot of action at the moment and uh, research interest of my own. Maybe Chris isn't most proud of his contribution that's in my edited book, but I think it's very good. If you want to go have a look at that, co-authored with Randy L. Belda. And today he'll be talking about how national institutions determine job quality in retail around the world. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris and just ask you, would you prefer to take questions as you go, or just questions of clarification and substantive questions and points at the end? My preference is the latter, just questions of clarification. And then we'll open it up at the end. But can I ask, how long am I supposed to talk? I should have asked this before I pick a card with you. <laughs> well, we have until 4.30. Okay. And you can time yourself within there and leave as much time for open discussion as you can. Okay. I'll just... Well, I want to um, echo what Mary said. I'm very impressed with the turnout, given that it's the sunniest day in six months and a Friday. So uh, pleased that you <laughs> you turned out to to hear this. And uh, there's a as, as this comes up, I'm going to note that at the bottom of this this first page, and I'm going to move past fairly quickly. There's a bunch of thank yous. There's a bunch of thank yous to funders, but a lot of this work is also collaborative with uh, colleagues in various parts of the world. Uh, the, the people I thank by name here are, are two, two really outstanding uh, graduate research assistants, one of the past and one of the present, who've been involved in some of this work. So yeah, none of us researchers works alone, and uh, there's, there's been a lot of support in, in helping this happen. So there's an endless uh, perpetual debate on the extent to which we should expect cross-national variation in lots of economic phenomena, but certainly jobs, to, to push towards convergence. And so there's, particularly in the era of globalization, there's a lot of people, particularly in economics departments, who emphasize the forces pushing for convergence. Uh, so that's a set of common forces, markets, capital flows that, that kind of unify uh, economic activities across the globe. And there's also a set of, of common actors in the form of the transnational corporations that increasingly are doing the same thing in lots of different places in the world. Uh, there's also a counter-argument, or a set of counter-arguments, which tend to be based more in departments of geography, sociology, business schools saying, well, in fact, we should not expect that kind of dramatic convergence because not only are there sort of durable institutional differences, but to some extent these institutional differences actually convey, uh, confer economic advantages, uh, competitive advantages. So it's not just that the French do things differently from us and the Japanese do things differently still, but that in fact these different ways of doing things lead uh, particular countries or particular industries in particular countries to excel in particular <coughs> forms of, of production, particular uh, consumer niches, and so on. And so one could look at this as a debate of, well, so is it convergence or not? I, I don't think that's a very interesting way of posing it, because there are some aspects of both anytime you look closely. But I think what's more interesting is to say, well, how do we explain this, this sort of mixed pattern of convergence in some ways, divergence in others, uh, and the, you know, the answers I'm going to come up with in this talk do tend to go back to, to national institutions. 
but not always in the ways that we might expect. I'm talking about retail. It's a big employer. It's, you know, in, in this country and in most of the uh, richer countries, it's bigger than manufacturing. Uh, it's also a, a low wage sector in most parts of the world, certainly in, in richer parts of the world. It's a sector where there's been some fairly interesting transformations, new competitive pressures. We, in this country, we think of Walmart as the big story, but as we'll see in a minute, it depends where in the world you stand, exactly which big box you're seeing coming in and, uh, and changing the landscape. Uh, but the fact that, that new uh, big box strategies based on high-tech logistics are transforming retail is true all over the world. Uh, Walmart is about to, or is it attempting to buy into South Africa at this point by buying the, I believe it's the second largest chain there. So the, the story continues. And so the last point then is the globalization of the retail sector. And one could, if you reflect a minute on retail, if you think about making cars, cars can be shipped all over the world. One thing about retail is that, although you know there is such a thing as as delivery, that the main retail experience, certainly the experience of retail food shopping, is localized. So, a first reaction might be, well, if you're looking about looking at the question of convergence, retail would be the last place you'd expect it to happen, because it's it's by its nature it's localized. It's when you think about the main things that are being sold in, in retail, it's things like food and clothing that are very culturally bound. And so there's a, a quote from, from Aoyama and Schwartz in one of the books, Stanley Brun's book on uh, Walmart, that says successful retail globalization is always successful retail localization. So that's one way of looking at it. On the other hand, there are some common forces that are shaping retail around the world. One is what for shorthand I'm going to call neoliberalism. There's a, a push towards, in general, deregulating, freeing up markets in many, many countries of the world. That's, that's a common factor. The kind of technology, the, the logistical, logistical technology that's revolutionized retail in this country is also uh, present all over the world. And then there's the the, the common actors that I've already referred to. So this is Walmart. Whoops, that's interesting. Is, is there a way to fiddle with this, or am I just, you're just going to have to picture? I wouldn't be the person who would know, as those of you who know me best know. Would anybody else Jamie? volunteer to come have a look? Do you want me to go poke oh, buttons oh. until it's fixed? Yes. Okay, good. But you know, what you can do is just, is just push it twice and you know, do the reboot, so it's just kind of turning it off and turning it on. But now that's not. It's, it's much worse. It's like a vertical hold button for those of us able hey, we'll, we'll to remember that. Fifteen minutes to reboot. If I remember correctly. No, I just meant I just meant switch the projector off and on. Uh, That's oh. always it. I'm going to take a class in AV. If I continue this. So it doesn't have Russia where Walmart is moving in, it doesn't have Chile, it doesn't have South Africa. So you can picture that footprint uh, spreading. Uh, here's, you know, here's this, you can see at least a small version of it. Number two, Carrefour, uh, which uh, based in France, but actually some overlap in footprint, but a whole bunch of other countries. Tesco, based in the UK. And again, uh, a, a very a related but, but quite different footprint. And then number four, based in Germany, is the Metro Group. Uh, again, a global footprint. And you can you know, continue. Avold from the Netherlands, uh, plus then you start getting into the, uh, the double mentions from some of these countries. And they're Japanese, 
companies that are uh, expanding throughout Asia. So there are definitely some, some global actors in, in this industry. Okay. Uh, now this isn't working either. But. <laughs> oh, it is? Yeah, it's going. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, one thing to emphasize for, for U.S. audiences is we think of Walmart as being the dominant retailer in the world. Walmart is the dominant retailer in the world because it dominates the largest market in the world, the United States. Not because it's in more countries or because it's the dominant player in most countries. And so, uh, whoops, yeah, I, I, I ripped over some slides there. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay. <coughs> Great. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. It worked. Is that the right spot? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Can I show it? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Grace under pressure. Thank you. Uh, well, now it's, it's my fault that there's a, a missing word there. It should say three research projects. But anyway, I, I want to talk about three research projects. I, this is my problem. I want to talk about all the different things I'm working on. And I'm even going to try to sneak in something about some additional work on, on Mexico uh, at, at some point. But mainly, I'm going to present results from, from three pieces of a larger global retail project. One is looking at uh, retail jobs in the United States and five European countries. This is with Francois Carré, Martin van Klaveren, and Dorothea Vostam. So basically comparing the same sector in different countries. Uh, then zooming in on the cashier job and doing a, a two-country comparison with the US and France. Francois Carré has evolved again. Also, Philippe Askenazi, Jean-Baptiste Berry, and uh, Sophie prunier pomer So there we're looking at, at precisely the same job. And then finally, looking at the same company by looking at how Walmart functions in different parts of the world. So let me start by talking about the, the, that six-country comparison, the other five countries, Denmark, France, Germany, Netherlands, and the UK. Uh, to the extent that you are classifying countries, uh, there's, there's a classification called varieties of capitalism that says, well, Denmark, Germany, and Netherlands are sort of coordinated market economies in, in the sense that uh, large coordinating entities, government, employer federations, large union federations make a lot of big decisions about uh, what happens in the economy. There's two liberal uh, economies, which is the United Kingdom and, and the United States, and then France doesn't really fit into this categorization too well because uh, it's got a much larger role for, for state, for government action. But we'll come back to why these comparisons might matter. This was looking at uh, large chains of food and consumer electronics. It's both based on case studies and analyses of, of the main data sources. And we're summarizing our findings as divergent convergence. There is some convergence, but it's really happening in rather different ways. So this is the slide that I started to talk my way through, which is just to say, be aware that as we travel these five other countries, Walmart is not one of the, uh, the dominant retailers. In the UK, they are, at this point, I think, number three. In the rest of these countries, they're not present at all. So this is not about what Walmart's doing. We'll get to that. This is more about what's happening with large-scale retail in each of these countries and why. So there are some convergences. In most of these countries, uh, retail wages have fallen in, in, at least in relative terms. The United States, they've actually fallen in absolute terms over the long run. Absolute meaning, if you look at, I, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, the, let me back up. Uh, real wages have fallen, and they've also fallen as a proportion of overall, of the overall average real wage. So in both those senses, retail jobs have gotten worse, and they've gotten worse relative to other jobs in the United States. In the other countries, that relative statement is also true, that um, relative to other industries, retail jobs have gotten worse. 
Why has this happened? Unions have gotten weaker in most of these countries. The spread of a discounting approach, where I'm talking about discounting as uh, selling based on keeping prices low and, and making money on, on quantity rather than on a large margin. Uh, that's, that's important. The spread of part-time work has contributed to, to some extent to undermining pay levels. In the United States, part of the story is that the real value, value of the minimum wage, which really sets the floor in retail and another number of other industries, but that's fallen over time. Uh, so part of this is, on average, retail workers are doing worse. Part of it, and particularly in, in some countries like Germany, is that what used to be sort of a single unified standard has ended up uh, splintering for, for different groups within the retail workforce. And I'll have more to say about that. Another convergence, yeah, go ahead. A question of clarification on the previous one. Um, how, how do you know that? Which? I mean, I mean, all those points, like how, like, um, how do you know that those are, uh, how, or how, how, how do I make are, a causal statement about yeah, this? Yeah, how do you know that those are important for the, for those, the, the graph that you had in the previous slide? Well, yeah, I'm making an argument about timing. So this is sort of case study analysis and uh, the, the timing of, of the decrease is, is, matches up well with this kind of spread of part-time work. So I, I, don't, I don't have strong causal evidence for this, although uh, some of the cases, I've been doing case studies of the retail industry, as it, as it turns out, since the late 1980s. And there certainly are a lot of individual stories of chains where um, the, the pay has gone down because of the spread of part-time work, because of a shift towards more of a discounting orientation. So I have both sort of macro timing and some micro case studies where I can Yeah, yeah, so I mean, so there's, a, there's an element of assertion here. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Second convergence is that this is a, a, an industry with a lot of young people and a lot of women working in it. Interestingly, it's, there, you don't see big concentrations of people of color and immigrants, not in the United States and not in most of the, the European countries. Uh, to the extent that, that we have an analysis of this, it comes from actually other work that, that uh, I and other people have done on sort of on race in, in hiring and there's a very clear message that comes from retail managers which is we want to have a workforce that our customer base feels comfortable with and that means uh, a workforce that to some extent mirrors our customer base to the extent that uh, customer bases are disproportionately white uh, that is reflected in, in the workforce as well. So even though we think of this as a relatively low wage job, and we think of people of color and immigrants being slotted into those jobs, that's less true of retail than it is of, of some other kinds of work. But not, not all is the same here. Uh, there is, this is, this definition of, of low wage work is saying two-thirds of the median hourly wage, if you fall below that two-thirds level, then you're a, uh, a low-wage worker. This is sometimes used for international comparisons. It's a relative definition of what's low wage. And when you look at the percentage of the retail workforce that's low wage, what's striking is the difference between France and Denmark on the one hand and everybody else. So that's the, really the difference to explain here. The U.S. is not strikingly different. Percent part-time, uh, again, France is, is the outlier, but there's quite a bit of variation with actually the Netherlands having the highest rate of part-time employment. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, just one quick clarification. So these are all hourly workers, so there aren't any people like drawn commission in the retail sector? Uh, it actually does does include, this, this includes all employees okay. in, in retail, so it does include commission workers, uh, I mean, it, it includes the range of, of uh, compensation schemes that are applied to hourly workers, basically, yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay, and then on turnover in the United States is the, is, is the outliers. So, 
So we can see that even though there are some similarities in what's happened over time and in, in the patterns of employment, there are also some important differences. There's also some divergence in work organization, which I'm going to sort of just hold that thought and I'll have more to say about it uh, shortly. So how can we explain some of these differences? Again, the compensation difference is basically Denmark and France versus everybody else. Are you saying that 50% of, for the UK, just under 50% yeah. of the retail workers are low wage? Are low wage in the sense that they earn less than two-thirds of the economy-wide okay. median. So, yeah. So, and you can see that actually the, the the other four countries are sort of clustered in the 40 to 50% range. And Denmark and France are, are down at half that rate or below. Is this ILO data? Uh, this is actually most. This is from national data sources. So the United States its current population survey. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it, it took some some harmonization efforts to get some of the European data to, to speak to the U.S. data. But to the extent that we can, uh, that that we grasp how the data is collected, that this is pretty a pretty consistent set. So yeah, I mean the ILO doesn't disaggregate it to this to this extent. So what's happening in Denmark? Well, Denmark has what's you know come to be viewed as sort of a standard Scandinavian or, or Nordic model. There's there's very high percentage of workers unionized. There's also the presence of work councils fairly universally in workplaces, which is sort of a yet another avenue for worker voice. There's pretty, still pretty centralized national level bargaining, although it's become more decentralized. And one of the goals within national bargaining of the union federations is to keep, is to limit the, the spreading apart of wages. All those things have tended to keep wages in, in what are otherwise low wage industries higher, keep wages in what are otherwise high wage industries lower. So have compressed that wage distribution. Now, Denmark is a coordinated market economy. So are Germany and Netherlands. In when you think about uh, you know the the big categorization of economies, but something rather different is happening in each of those other coordinated market economies. In Germany, the mini job uh, is a provision in national law that says for people working in essentially part-time jobs that pay less than a certain amount. Uh, neither the employer nor the worker has to pay into the, you know, the, the social security system. So these sort of short part-time workers are much, it's cheaper both for the employer and for the worker uh, to, to take these jobs. What it's turned out is that employers have taken advantage of the fact that the worker doesn't have to pay the social security tax to actually drive down wages below the, the legally mandated or collectively bargained level. So this is a case where um, either a collective bargaining contract or a law is on the books, but employers get away with paying less because uh, workers are willing to put up with it. And this is primarily held by married women who get Social Security through their husbands, uh, are interested in only working part-time, and therefore are, are not raising much of a fuss. But this phenomenon has, has grown and exploded the, the percentage of mini jobs to the point where it's actually influenced the overall distribution of wages within retail. Uh, in Netherlands, there's a minimum wage, but also a sub-minimum wage for youths. Now, of course, the, the kicker here is that there also is a sub-minimum wage for youths in Denmark. Uh, but in the Netherlands, businesses have been much more aggressive about sort of Bringing, shifting to a, a youth workforce to exploit this, this sub-minimum wage. Uh, in Denmark, the unions have, have put a break on that. So the outcome has turned out a little differently. In France, uh, it's, it's interesting because in France, the collectively bargained wage in retail is below the national minimum wage. In other words, it has no impact on people's wages. It's, it's the minimum wage quite a high minimum wage in France 
that is boosting these retail workers. Uh, U.S. and U.K. also have minimum wages, but in both cases it's not high enough to have anything like this effect. Oh, there it is. Um, so, I mean, these are not the only differences. I mean, I've been looking at wages, but there's a whole set of things in terms of, of the benefit package that uh, that uh, European countries have a much more universal system of, of pensions and health insurance. It's not just uh, a social security. Uh, and the European Union has mandated wage parity per hour for full-time and part-time workers. There's a set of other uh, pieces in place that uh, tend to compress these differences to some extent in, uh, in Europe. So in the United States, there are certain efficiency incentives for shifting to part-time work, like you can cover just the hours, the peak hours, when you need extra staffing, but there are also cost incentives in terms of lower pay, lower benefits that are not available in Europe. What's interesting, in, and this is, this is where I'm sort of shoveling in a, uh, another paper on, on comparing Mexico and the United States. In Mexico, when I started doing field work in, in retail in Mexico, I was very stunned to find out that there was basically no part-time work in retail in Mexico. And when I started asking why not? They said, well, well, first of all, the minimum wage is a daily minimum wage. So if we bring somebody in for four hours, we pay them for eight anyway. Secondly, uh, the work week in retail is six days and eight hours. So the issue of covering weekends, we just have to sort of overlap two of those six-day sequences. We've got weekends covered. It's not the same as, as a five-day work week. And finally, there is a universal, though, sort of lousy set of, of social insurance. So there, it's not like the United States where there's where private benefits, health insurance and so on, health insurance and pension, are tied to whether you're part-time or full-time. Full-timers get those benefits, making them more expensive. Part-timers don't. In Mexico, everybody gets the public benefits, which are fairly lousy, except for people in, in much better jobs. Uh, another fact is, I mean, you asked about commission payment. United States electronics retailers are rapidly moving away from, from commission. So uh, Circuit City is no more, but both Circuit City and Best Buy by the early 2000s had gotten off a commission system. That's a change that hasn't happened in, in Europe yet. And it's interesting because you actually have collective bargaining around commissions, where unions bargain around an adequate wage floor and then bargain around the commission rate. So there's it's, it's much more hemmed in by collective bargaining in Europe than in the United States. Schedules. Well, one aspect of this is not actually labor regulation, but the regulation of when stores are open. Uh, blue laws, as, as they're sometimes called, although I don't know if people talk about these anymore because there aren't many of them in the United States anymore. When I was a kid, uh, you know, stores shut down maybe at, at 6, 7 o'clock at night. If you didn't get your shopping done by then, you were out of luck. Uh, but in any case, we'll see that it, it's, it's rather different in, in Europe. So, in the United States, a shift towards almost no restrictions on, on opening hours. It's true that retailers uh, tend to pay some pay differential for, for night or, or Sunday work, but those are being phased out. Uh, over time. In Europe, most of these countries we're talking about have, have limitations on Sunday opening. So one of the two potential big uh, weekend shopping days, uh, the, the typical law says you can only be open, open a certain number of Sundays per year. Uh, and in all five, there's a requirement of a premium for what's called unsocial hours, meaning nights and weekends. But again, the pressure, the, the push is to, to take away these, these restrictions. Uh, we do have, in the United States, an, an overtime premium, although there's interesting research by Netta Bernhardt and others showing that in, in low-wage jobs, uh, that, that premium is quite widely 
violated. In other words, people don't get paid for um, time and a half for working over the, the 40 hour limit. There's, in retail, there's a huge, not, not just funny schedules, but very variable schedules where literally every week or two your schedule can change. Uh, you're supposed to get, you know, and, and the formal rule in a lot of these chains is you get one to two weeks notice of, of schedule changes, but the reality, as those of you who've worked in retail probably know, is it can happen in real time. They can literally call you up and say, it's busy, can you come in? Or they can sort of come up to you and say, it's going slow, would you mind you know, going home for the rest of your shift? Um, so the other piece of this is that we conclude that the store managers were in some ways the most exploited people around. You talk to store managers who are working 60, 70 hours a week, because they were juggling this crazy schedule of potentially in a large supermarket, several hundred people, constantly having flaky young people not show up, quit, whatever, and having to, to fill those holes. I mean, I don't know how many times we went to a store to interview the manager and, and they were like mopping up a spill or something like that because nobody else was going to do it. This is probably the most stunning number in the presentation, which says, in Germany, uh, Retailers, companies in general, are required to give six months' notice of any schedule change. Does this really happen? Well, no. I, I mean, the, the, the truth is that there's a lot of negotiation that goes on around this, and where there isn't a strong union or works council, uh, businesses just ignore the regulation. But just having that on the books obviously changes the climate in terms of the, the flexibility of schedules. And so here, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting to see Germany and Denmark uh, with, with this lead time that's sort of unimaginable uh, in, in our experience in the United States. What about work organization? Well, there's a, a discussion in, I guess, more labor sociology and labor economics about how do you get flexibility? One way is numerical flexibility. So just how many workers do you have on hand at a given time? So using temp workers using sort of what I was saying before about part-time to cover peak hours, these are ways to get numerical flexibility. There's a trade-off between that and functional flexibility, which is, okay, have people take on different tasks depending on what's needed. And so cross-train and have people fill in in different ways. What we found in retail in both Europe and the United States is that both things are going on. There's a lot of numerical flexibility, and there's a lot of functional flexibility, where people are sort of floating from, from one task to another. The difference between the United States and at least some of the European countries is whether you had horizontal functional flexibility, meaning you float from stocking in one section to stocking in another section, to cashiering, to unloading boxes in the back, every job in the store moving horizontally, or vertical functional flexibility, which means you focus in one department, but you can do a whole range of tasks, from stocking to uh, cleaning in that department to actually uh, planning layouts or, or ordering stuff. And what's interesting, particularly in Germany, in Germany, over 80% of the retail workforce, this is the, you know, the hourly retail workers, uh, has a vocational certificate in, in retail. So they've actually studied retail, they know the whole industry, they know how to order, uh, and they've made, if you will, long-term commitment to this industry. Uh, they're relatively stable, although not always well compensated for this. Again, the mini jobs has really undermined the situation. I mean, all those, those women who are doing the mini jobs, most of them have this, this vocational certificate. <clears throat> Through the, through the apprenticeship uh, program. So, interesting contrast there between a more vertical flexibility of taking on tasks within a particular department versus horizontal flexibility floating all over the store. I'm going to skip the rest of this because I've got too much to talk about. Uh, looking down to a micro scale, the question is what's wrong with this picture? She's looking up elevated. Um. But, but why is she looking up? She's sitting, because she's, so she's sitting down. Oh. This is a cashier sitting down, which is how it is in Europe. 
Uh, and this, this happens to be at, at Avol, which is you know, with a, uh, a Dutch company. But yeah, cashiers in Europe sit down. And there's actually uh, a, a Europe-wide ergonomic standard that says cashiers should not be made to, you know, to stand up for a, a shift. And when I mentioned this to a US retail manager, he said, well, well how would they bag? Well, of course, part of the story is that in Europe, the customer does most of the bagging, too. But uh, anyway, so, so there's interesting things like this that, to some extent, uh, I mean, we could say this grew out of the, the Europe-wide standard, but the reality is that the Europe-wide standard grew out of a very strong sort of health and safety inspection tradition in Europe. And in fact, a sort of there was a culture of cashier sitting down long before there was a Europe-wide standard. So interesting to to suddenly be confronted with this, like, oh, okay. I can give you a little insight to that because okay. I mean, women, at least in England originally. You were required to allow women workers to sit down for five minutes out of every hour because of um, women's, basically women's problems, like prolapse of the uterus or things right. like that, that they were worried that female workers did. So I don't know if that also applies to male workers in retail, but any, you know, traditionally in England, if you had women workers, they had to sit down for part of the hour. Okay. That, you know, no, that, that makes a lot of sense that that's part of the, the thinking behind. Okay, well, uh, I'm not doing so well. I've only gotten through one study so far, but the, <laughs> but that was the one I had the most to say about. But let me just say, part of what's interesting here is this is not just about institutions regulating labor markets. It's also about things like store opening. And when we get to the France-U.S. comparison, uh, we'll, we'll see other examples of that. Exit options is the name that's been coined for things like the mini-job or like the youth subminimum wage that basically creates an opening through which companies can uh, can sort of avoid a particular set of, of standards and the particular strategies that are followed by business obviously affect the actual outcomes in these countries. Let's move on to, to sort of uh, a closer look at the US and France and the cashier job in particular. So this is actually the, uh, Exploiting more of, of the case study work, but again, also some uh, some statistics. And both wages and productivity are considerably higher for cashiers in, in France. So wages are higher, uh, but these are various measures of, of productivity down to, if you will, the most fine grade one, which is just scan rates, expected scan rates. And what you can see is that all the way down the line, French cashiers are more productive than U.S. ones. I mean, it, it was funny because one chain we visited in the United States, they were so proud that they scanned at, at 25 uh, items per minute. And it's like, at that point, we hadn't heard about the, the French cashiers for which that was the low end. But yeah. Why is this happening? And the argument is that there's, there's rather distinct labor strategies here. I've already talked about some of the aspects of the United States, but it's, it's a part-time, young worker, high turnover, low-skill strategy. In France, uh, it's much more based on mature women instead of young workers, lower turnover, uh, less use of part-time, but the, the French have taken Taylorism, the kind of scientific management, well beyond where it's come in the United States. And so it's extremely fast work in France. Does this, have, does this come back to the task? Well, as I, as I mentioned, uh, customers bag in, uh, in Europe. And the other thing that, uh, so whereas, whereas the cashier bags in the United States, the other thing is that uh, in, in, in Europe, you're expected to weigh and, and identify, label, uh, any produce, whereas, the, as you know, you know if you're, if you're shopping in a supermarket in the United States, the cashier IDs the, the fruit or vegetable and weighs it. Well, it turns out those don't explain it too well because 
a large part of the French sample is, is hypermarkets. You know, what, that's their, their name for super centers, what a, what a Walmart is that sells a wide range of mer merchandise. And, and in hypermarkets, the cashiers and baggers do, uh, do actually take care of identifying and, and weighing the, the produce. And in terms of, of bagging, it doesn't, I mean, it may affect some of the productivity numbers. It doesn't affect the scan rates because the way you count the scan rate, you turn off the, the clock when you're bagging. So that doesn't explain a, a faster scan rate. It actually turns out that there's a whole set of added tasks that European, that French cashiers are expected to take on precisely because customers are bagging. So they're supposed to do a much more careful inspection to make sure that, that the customers aren't pulling a fast one in terms of stealing stuff. They're supposed to look in, in bottle six packs to make sure that some small expensive item, item didn't get slipped in it and so on. So there's actually added tasks on the European side. So tasks don't seem to, uh, differences in tasks don't seem to explain it. Well, okay, we've, we've already looked at the wage difference and so that's obviously relevant here. The minimum wage keeps those, those French wages higher. Uh, this shopping regulation is tremendously <coughs> important. So, U.S. stores are open much longer hours than French stores. There are restrictions on the number of stores that can open. This is in the name of uh, protecting the little neighborhood boulangerie, but what it really means is that the, you know, the car four that's already open when this law got passed has something of a local monopoly because it's very hard to open another grocery store. So, fewer peak hours in France, less sales area, store area, per inhabitant, but the French still cook. They don't all go to McDonald's or, you know, get takeout for dinner. So they're actually buying a lot more groceries uh, uh, per person in the United States than they are in the United States. So what happens? Well, this is our rendition of uh, a French supermarket during during peak hours. There's basically, you're trying to push a lot of customers through a very limited amount of floor space. You have huge, huge, I mean, literally, you know, 50 cash, cashiers and, and cash registers set up next to each other. And you've got to be scanning fast. And in fact, the French team had an ergonomist, and there's a huge number of repetitive motion industries associated with this kind of work. So uh, it's nice to be highly paid, but there is a trade-off. The other thing is that the limits on opening new stores do give them some oligopoly power and that also can help underpin uh, the ability to pay more. So that's part of the story as well. They can, they can afford to pay more precisely because it's harder to open up a, a new supermarket to, to compete with them. And it's interesting because even within the United States, we heard uh, from chains in, in, in the South where the, the uh, land use regime is a little more relaxed, there's, there's not as much, you know, if, if you think about uh, New York, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, and the fights that have happened when Walmart's tried to open up its store there, that just doesn't happen in the South. And so the Southern retailers were saying, the competition is just incredible. You know, there's constantly new stores opening up. There's always somebody underpricing you. We didn't hear that in the same way in other parts of the country. So there are regional differences in the United States as well, but certainly across national differences between the U.S. and France. Uh, what's happening in terms of, of labor supply? So again, you've got the, the youth labor market in the United States and the, uh, the, the mature women dominating the, the retail workforce in France. This is also kind of a startling number. The number of hours per year that U.S. and French students spend in high school, well, that's, that's eye-opening. Um, so, gee, the U.S. youth have plenty of time to, to get a, a part-time job. Uh, and there's a set of, of benefits for, for moms. Child care, paid maternity leave, and so on, and fairly long uh, paid maternity leave, that, uh, that help women uh, sort of balance these jobs with, with family obligations. So you can see how this might tilt things towards youth in the United States and towards women in France. Yeah, so this, this is also kind of a striking number. This is 16 to 19 year olds working 
in France and the United States, four times as high a percentage in the United States. We don't think of ourselves as a child labor country, but when you compare us to France, we are. There's also a, a set of normative or, or cultural factors that, that we found in, in talking to retailers, and also just because we live in these two countries, um, that whereas in the United States we think about the hourly wage, in France there's a much stronger focus on the monthly salary. So to the extent that people are working part-time, uh, there's still this upward pressure on, on what uh, the retailer is paying. Uh, there's, in France, there's the notion that employees should be able to shop in, in, in the store and so that if you're talking about a middle class store, you've got to pay something that, that approaches the middle class wage. So these normative differences as well push towards higher pay in France. Part of what's interesting is to say, well, is there anybody in the United States who's following a, quote, French strategy? And we did, and we didn't, these are relatively small numbers of case studies. This was, I think, 10, 10 food chains in the United States, seven, seven, actually seven stores and five chains in France. But anyway, in the United States, there, there were, was one chain that basically specialized in, in serving small underserved rural communities and therefore maintaining a geographic monopoly. Sounds a little like the Walmart strategy, but this is even smaller communities that are not big enough to support a Walmart. And then there was one company that uh, has a very Tayloristic sort of throughput, you know, how much stuff can you get through that cash register uh, type of approach. That's where we heard about, you know, wow, our, our target scan rate is 25 items per minute. So these, are, these guys are tending more towards the French approach. But what's more common, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get to talk to Walmart. But they all talked about Walmart, and they all said, most of them said, we're competing with Walmart by trying to offer, you know, fresher meats, better produce, you know, a bigger olive bar, uh, whatever it is. So these two sort of more French approaches to, to competition in terms of geographic monopoly and tailorized rapid throughput uh, were the exception out of this list. So, okay. We had a set of institutional effects, including an emphasis, emphasis this time on what's happening on the supply side, high schools, uh, child care, and so on. But, I mean, our markets are also mattering here, the degree of market power that, uh, that stores have. And we've had at least some evidence for, for a cultural effect. So, what is Walmart? I don't really need to answer that question. Um, what do we know about Walmart? It's cheap. Uh, lousy wages and benefits, anti-union, uh, squeezes suppliers to, to try to keep costs down, and, it, it, and it's expanding like crazy. Uh, and it became clear through my field work in Mexico, and then I started looking further, that this is not as true when you look at the rest of the world. That Walmart does act differently in different parts of the world. So, is Walmart the low price seller? Well, not in the big cities of Mexico. So it, it turns out that there's a, a special attorney general for consumers that does detailed price surveys in Mexico's three biggest surveys. And Walmart does come out uh, looking better than, than most of the other big chains, but it does not come out looking like this is the, uh, the, the low price seller most of the time. And in fact, there, there's this great quote from from Retailing Today magazine that says, for the average Mexican, shopping at a Walmart supercenter is a high-end experience. Hmm. China, Walmart's also selling to the middle class. And so then, you might think that in Germany, a high-wage country, uh, you know, certainly heavily unionized, relatively highly paid workforce, that Walmart would be able to uh, underprice the German retailers. But Susan Christofferson, who teaches at Cornell, has this, this great story that the, the day the Walmart opened in Berlin, the Aldi across the street was selling the same loaf of bread for a third the price. And what happened, Walmart got driven out of Germany in a relatively small number of years, and it, it had to do with getting underpriced by uh, 
uh, German disc counters. So the story in Germany is that there were hard disc counters with very well established supply chains. Walmart coming in and trying to grow organically was not able to, to compete with them. Uh, there was, you know, when suppliers were looking at who to give the best discount to, Walmart was the new kid on the block, as opposed to these discounters they've been doing business with for decades. And so that did not work out so well with, for Walmart. Mexico and China, the story is somewhat different. Uh, it's, it's hard to price lower than the informal sector. Uh, this is when my wife and I spent uh, six months in Morelia when, when I was doing a Fulbright. Uh, we bought these, these muffins from this woman pretty much every week at, at the weekly street market. There was, um, and you can see her capital, aside from her oven at home, consists of three crates. She is not paying taxes. She is not paying rent. Uh, that's a pretty low overhead operation. And so it's, it's not necessarily reasonable for Walmart to think that they can underprice. I, you know, this is just one example. If you walk through any Mexican city, there's sort of an exuberance of, of informal retail. This is from information from, from Mexico that I, I collected when I was there in, in 2004. And what you see is that Walmart is actually paying at the high end of at what at that time were the big four chains. What's important to keep in mind is that this is the low end of the wage distribution in Mexico. This is not high wage jobs. It's just that all the retailers are paying down around the low end, and among them, Walmart is paying a little more. Uh, benefits turn out to be comparable. Uh, the one chain that offered a little more was Gigante, which went bankrupt in 2007, <laughs> perhaps because it was paying out too much in benefits. Anyway, so, so at this point, I haven't gone back to look, but I imagine that the benefits are very comparable across the big chains. Uh, similar findings in, in China and Argentina, I'm sort of depending on, on the research of other people here. I've not done field work in those countries. What about Germany? Again, high wage, unionized. Nope. Uh, Walmart actually paid a little more than the union scale. Uh, and the, the story in Germany was basically, this was Walmart attempting to do a union avoidance strategy with, uh, as it turned out, limited success. But, so they tried to pay a little more than the union scale for that purpose. In, in Mexico and China, well, if you're selling to the middle class, then you can't hire just anybody. This is from Walmart's web page, and it's, you don't too often see such a white-looking group of, of Mexicans. This is, you know, the, the Walmart staff greeting you. And, I mean, obviously, you walk into a Walmart, they're, they're not all pale-skinned. But the point is that the image they're trying to project is uh, you know, one that, that's tied to the, this racial imagery, which is a little higher class, uh, better quality, and so on. In order to, to, to do that, you've got to have people who, um, who do not come from the very bottom of the labor market, who have some, some good work habits, prepared to provide good customer service. That's the package that, that Walmart is trying to provide. In, in Mexico and China. What about union representation? This is not the Walmart union marching through the city of Morelia. Uh, this is actually the uh, junior high school teachers union uh, carrying their red flags, uh, which just have a union insignia on it. Uh, but from what I can tell, all the Mexican uh, Walmarts have union contracts. I, I can't prove that because I haven't been to, I haven't looked at all the union contracts, but the cities where I've been able to get access to union contracts, um, Walmart is unionized. And it's not just in Mexico. There's a bunch of other countries where Walmart is operating or did operate where they're either partly or completely unionized. So what's going on? Well, we're familiar, we're, we're sort of living in the upper right-hand corner here. We're living in a country where unionization is not required by law but where there actually are serious unions. Uh, United Food and Commercial Workers may not be uh, the most militant union around, but it's, it's quite serious about getting a good deal for its workforce. In those situations, Walmart has been very, very resistant to unions. On the other hand, the lower left-hand corner, which includes Mexico, uh, and for that matter, China and Argentina, you've got unions that basically 
are largely invisible to the, the workers. There is a requirement for collective bargaining, but why not go along if, in fact, what we found in Mexico was that most workers were unaware there was a union there at all. I think the, the interesting cell here is Germany and Brazil, where there is laws strongly support collective bargaining. The requirement might be a little too strong, but, but basically the laws are designed to, um, to support collective bargaining fairly strongly. But you've also got serious unions, and in these two countries, Walmart uh, kept a stiff upper lip and worked with the unions. They're, they're out of Germany, but they're still going in Brazil, and reportedly, you know, they don't always treat the union nice and vice versa, but they, they, they've got a, a solid working relationship. Uh, colleagues that are doing research on Brazil have told me. So Walmart can adapt. Uh, and, I, I mean, there, I could go on and on, and, and I do in, in one of the articles that, uh, that, that's posted. Walmart is not always the, the company that's squeezing suppliers the hardest. They're actually, I mentioned this before, they're not as global as some of the other retailers. And, as I mentioned, they pulled out of Germany, they pulled out of Korea, they pulled out of Hong Kong, they pulled out of Indonesia. There's a series of cases where Walmart went into a country and then left. What is invariant in the Walmart model? Uh, this is my hypothesis, that discounting in the sense of uh, increasing volume of sales and making money on, on sort of volume rather than margin is poor. The, the automated logistics, I was once at a Walmart conference where one of the experts said uh, Walmart is a, country, is, is a company of propeller heads, meaning logistics engineers, who happen to run stores. Uh, and I think that there's some truth to that. And then monopsony in the sense that they really do try to squeeze suppliers. They may not always squeeze them the hardest, but based on how big they are, uh, they certainly uh, use their buying power to, to drive down prices. So I think those are core. I think that particularly the labor aspects are not core, and they've proven that they can adapt on that score. Okay, so I'm running out of time, but let me just try to pull together the, the three studies a little. So institutions do matter a lot, uh, and they matter in various ways because they regulate employment practices directly, like a minimum wage or like a bargaining uh, setup. They also regulate things like, like store opening hours, land use. Uh, in Mexico, the, the degree to which informal businesses get closed down or don't. They, they don't get closed down because people know that over half the, the workforce is in the informal sector, so you, politically they just can't do it. Uh, and the, the things that I mentioned, particularly in France, which is various kinds of institutions that, that somehow regulate or modulate uh, labor supply. All those institutions matter. Uh, Markets also matter. Certainly the income distribution matters a lot. Uh, the, the, the market structure in terms of strength of competitors matters. Uh, culture matters, particularly when comparing countries where the cultures are quite different. So if we compare the US and Canada, cultural differences are not huge. But if we compare the United States and China, or, uh, or uh, you know, Russia and, and Brazil, uh, there's those differences do, do turn out to be important. Now, I actually wanted to just close here with, with one story about, about Walmart, which is that in the same year, uh, 2007, Walmart pulled out of both Germany and South Korea. And one, there are many reasons why they pulled out, but one interpretation that I heard from, from people who studied Walmart in, in Germany and then I heard another thing from people who said Walmart in South Korea, and I take credit for putting these, these two things I heard together, even though I didn't do any of the research involved, uh, is in, in South Korea, they were trying to sell to the middle class, but the level of service that Walmart provides, Walmart thinks of itself as, we provide a high level of service, we've got the 10-foot rule, you know, you're supposed to, to greet somebody, if, if a customer, if they step within 10 feet of you. So they think of themselves as a friendly, customer service oriented store, for the Korean middle class consumers, Walmart did not make it in terms of service. They were accustomed to being weighted on hand and hand and foot, and that was not the Walmart model. And that was part of why Walmart did not succeed in that market. In Germany, on the other hand, uh, the Germans were like, why, are, why is this cashier smiling at me? 
And, and so apparently it became this major problem of male customers start like hitting on the, the, the women cashiers because the women cashiers were instructed to smile at the customers. And so there were all these sort of sexual harassment issues coming up. So again, sort of a, a cultural mismatch turned out to be a problem in terms of, of getting a foothold in the country. Uh, I have some ideas about public policy implications, but I've talked enough, so I will stop there. Thanks. Adapting to the monopsony 
retail corporation rather than the other way around. It just seems that for in this country, it could be an interaction, an easy interaction for Walmart to have cultures in the South adapt to it based yeah. on the way it operates. But then in other countries, it may be a lot more difficult based on the fact that they have established retail chains that have been there already before Walmart got there. It may take maybe a couple of decades before a culture can adapt its way around a monopoly like that. Well, first of all, there, there is an adaptation happening, and, and you can call it modernization, you can call it McDonaldization. But, you know, in, in Mexico, the tradition is that you, you have the, the comida at, at 2 in the afternoon, and you have a siesta after that, and everybody goes home to their family, and there's, you know, it's almost like there's a constitutional clause that says there has to be a, a tortilleria within walking distance. Your oldest kid can go out and get hot tortillas for the, for the comida. So that's, that's the historical approach. What you find is, is in the cities, you know, that's dying. You know, people are eating their lunch at their desks like every, everywhere else. And so, yeah, the, the culture is changing, and the fact that Walmart is coming and McDonald's is I, it's not like these places are untouched by this process. What's interesting is sort of the ways that, that do change and the ways that are, that are more resistant. The other thing I want to say is there's a great book by a historian, Bethany Morton, uh, To Serve God and Walmart, M-O-R-E-T-O-N where she argues very strongly that, um, that Walmart's culture continues to be sort of a white, small-town, southern evangelical culture. And that part of what's made it very successful in some parts of the world, notably uh, Central America, is in fact that that's an appealing culture to, to a lot of people in those, in those settings. Okay, you, you, you've, you've built up a hypothesis here, but where is the other industry that you can use for all the counterfactuals? I mean, can you use something like the white goods industry alone, or you can, can you go ahead and break your retail into small and large and say, well, here, look at this, we've, we've, we've shown the consistency through the same effects mirroring themselves through other industries from your institutions. Do you have a, a couple of comparison industries to work through? Well, I mean, we do have... Uh, Consumer food and, and consumer electronics, uh -huh. but but what I'll say is that um, is that there does seem to be some variation by industry. Uh -huh. Retail seems to uh, well, retail on the on the one hand is particularly aggressive in, in exploring these, these these exit options, these these ways to get under standards. On the other hand, retail is inherently localized uh, because of, of taste, so that. Uh, Harry Katz and Owen Darbyshire have this book, Divergent Convergences, that's mainly about the telecoms industry. That says, sort of, as that's globalized, uh, that in fact there really has been a much, much greater uh, convergence. Uh, so, so I'm, I want to be cautious about saying these institutions are so robust that regardless of the configuration of the industry, you're going to see the same thing. Because that doesn't seem to be true. Uh, well, it's only the ones that have to localize. So maybe it's certain kinds of services that you could use, uh, it, it, or, or even splitting that "quote unquote" retail up into several groups. Yeah. Grocery stores are extremely different depending upon where you look. I right. mean, even straight down to things like aisle width. Yeah. So have you split up the retail industry a bit more in order to test the yeah, hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, th this is further analysis I'm doing. Well, it's. I mean, there, there's, there's sort of the, the food electronics comparison. I, I'm sort of backing off what I was about to say because I'm looking more at the, at the formal, informal comparison in, in Mexico, but I don't really have a comparison in the other countries. So, so I'm getting some pieces of the picture, but I don't have a big cross-national comparison beyond the, the, the food um, electronics comparison. Okay, thank you. Much. But I will say that this does hold, at, at least in, in food and electronics, it's pretty consistent. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. Um, I thought it was very effective in showing how uh, places even like Walmart, it seems like Walmart has to adapt to local conditions. Um, but that in itself doesn't demonstrate they're not a force of convergence. Right. Because they be able to be able to function in another country, they have to adapt in certain ways to set up that way. Right? So they aren't simply the same as Walmart in the United States. So it doesn't mean they're not putting pressure in that. Economy and society towards a more typical Walmart model. Um, and I wondered if you could say anything about the degree to which 
one where it seems to be, um, in the cases you study, it seems to pull things towards what we think of Walmart in the United States by having a president in another country. Walmart pulls things, at least where it's, where it's the biggest, pulls things towards Walmart in that country, which is not necessarily the same as Walmart in the United States. So uh, there, there is, um, when Walmart went into Mexico, uh, the other retailers started making investments in upgrading their logistical systems, uh, started trying to match an everyday low price, pricing strategy, and so on. So, so some aspects of the U.S. model, but there are other ways, I mean, you know, this, this is anecdotal, but one of my favorite interviews was somebody who wasn't working at Walmart anymore, but um, went to work at, at the Walmart when it first opened up in her city, and she said, she, had, she said, it was great working at Walmart until they handed management over to the Mexicans. <laughs> and, and, you know, basically what she was talking about is that the Mexican management culture is much more hierarchical. Uh, the U.S. management culture, which Bethany Morton talks about, uh, is much more, at least on the surface, egalitarian. There's, Morton talks about this evangelical concept of, of servant leadership, you know, which is Sam Walton comes into the store and is bagging right next to the cashier. Uh, and so for Mexican workers, this was great. You know, it's, it's like uh, they call their managers by their first names and, uh, and you know, walk in the, the office and, and raise questions, but then when sort of Mexican management took over, things snapped back to some extent. So I, I think it's, it's, it's an evolving situation, and I do think that, that Walmart spreading or McDonald's spreading does bring cultures for convergence, and I think, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where you never actually come to rest in an equilibrium. There's always another perturbation. So the question of whether it would eventually lead to convergence, I don't think we're ever going to have a, a satisfactory answer to that. You have statistics on the proportion of retail sales accounted for by Walmart in the U.S. versus some of the other countries because it also will depend upon how big they are as a percentage of the retail. Now, they may be in certain cities, obviously, like in certain rural areas and not effective. Right. where they're not at. But, I mean, you didn't talk about No. It. I mean, because if there's one Walmart, let's say, yeah, they're not going to have an overall effect on the country, per se. They're going to have a, a certain effect. But So I just wonder, in terms of uh, percentages. Walmart's bigger in Mexico uh, than, as a percentage than it is in the United States. Oh, it is? Yeah. Right. Uh, and basically, Mexico is sort of a unique situation. It bought the biggest chain. Uh, which has not been able to do, in a, actually may have done that in some of the Central American countries, but in no other country has been able to do that. The other thing which, I, again, I can't establish causality, but it's an interesting observation, is the places where Walmart has really flourished are in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Central America, where there's sort of a continuous geographic space. And at this point, after years, in continental South America, where it now has Brazil, Argentina, Chile, uh, and so again, has a huge contiguous space. The places where it's, you know, uh, gone out the most quickly is where it had a small foothold in a small geographic area. So, a uh, small foothold in Germany and Hong Kong, and so on. Uh, and so that leads me I, again. I'm going way beyond my evidence here, but that leads me to think that in fact the ability to manage far-flung logistics system is a really, really important part of the <coughs> advantage that, that Walmart is bringing to. Them. Uh, to the table. So, yeah. Uh, I find the story very compelling to look from the side of management and labor. But I wonder if you could tell a parallel and intriguing story from the side of consumption and income distribution. That is to say that one of the problems of Walmart in the United States is it has not succeeded in upselling. That is, it can't really penetrate to the point of delivering goods that often carry a higher margin. So people have this interesting comparison between high wage Costco and low wage a Walmart. But I think also your cases about Walmart failure might reflect the fact that in countries in which there's an increase in national wealth, in which there's a sector that's able to up buy, which right. encourages people to upsell, um, Walmart may be comparatively um, disadvantaged. And I think that the heart of your talk 
rests on the fact that the technology fits very well everywhere where it fits. But it's not convergent in a world of lumpy wages, in a world of uh, varying tastes, because that's not the way Walmart has comported itself. Uh, so in some ways, it's the limits of specialization. And the wage thing may be very important, understanding how far you can push within that uh, low wage, everyday, low price sector. But on the other hand, they just may not be able to um, succeed in, in uh, an environment in which uh, retailing reaches a, a higher end. Yeah, although my argument is, is that in a lot of countries, uh, they're not selling to, to the lower end. They're selling to, to some, someone in the middle. You know, so again, China, Mexico, uh, the, 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 that's the situation. Uh, and that they are seen as uh, sort of a, a superior brand because they're American. Uh, you know, they, they haven't read all the exposés of, of Walmart in the United States. So, so it's, in that case, it's, I mean, I've, I've argued that the limitation in Mexico is not so much an inability to sell to the higher end, it's an inability to sell to the lower end. There's also some idiosyncratic factors. They, the, the chain that they bought had a stratified set of what are called banners, you know, the different types of stores, and they actually had a high-end banner called Superama that already had, had sort of established a, a high-end brand. So that's the very highest end of, of Walmart in Mexico. I mean, you know, and, and it's, it's like a, you know, they got, they got specialty stuff there. So I'm not ruling that out altogether uh, for, for a place. And, and again, the situation in Germany was that they weren't able to position themselves as an effective discounter. Uh, people went to, you know, the hard discounters where stuff is like just stacked up on a concrete floor when they wanted cheap stuff. They didn't want cheap stuff. You know, Walmart was sort of in this awkward in-between space. So I think it's more complicated than just they, they can't upsell. In this country, I think that's true, that, that that's an issue. And the Wall Street Journal just had a piece uh, a couple of weeks ago that said Walmart is going back to its roots. You know, it was trying to out-target Target, and it's realized, you know, its, its sales have been sort of bumping along and, and, and stagnant for several years since it tried that. So now they're going back to just selling, you know, pilot high and sell it cheap. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I was curious if you uh, you hinted at it a little bit, talking about the difference in the U.S. South versus uh, other places mm. in the United States. Did that present any problems using uh, nations as a unit of analysis? Absolutely. I mean, and you know, the question is: is the relevant comparison between the United States and France, or the United States and the EU? Uh, and increasing, I mean, even though we know all the reasons why the EU is not a United States, uh, there are ways in becoming, it, it's becoming more of the United States, certainly free mobility of labor, capital, trade, and, and so on. So I think that, um, I think you can learn something from both levels of analysis. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's, there's sort of a northern Mexico, southern Mexico story. Uh, which, which actually, I, I guess this this does confirm Bob's <laughs> Bob's point because um, because the argument I got from people in northern Mexico and well, I can't say quite which chains I talked to but um, was was that Walmart had not the north is wealthier this is, this is Monterrey so that this is like the, the richest large city in the, in the country uh, that Walmart had not been able to establish as much of a foothold there because basically people were on average, a little richer, they were more discerning consumers, and that the Walmart offering uh, was already outshone by supermarkets that had developed to, to sell to that clientele. So yeah, no, I, I, think, I think you can get some leverage from national comparisons and other kinds of leverage through regional comparisons. Uh, so, yeah, I guess. Oh, I think, well, let's kind of go back to the student here. Yeah, great idea. I think this will have to be the last question. I've got burning questions myself. Oh. We're gonna have to let off the hook here. Uh, kind of along the lines of what uh, Professor Gallup was asking about conversions. I was wondering primarily in uh, the UK, because the UK, I believe, has Walmart with ASDA yeah. as opposed to Walmart. And I was wondering when they bought ASDA, did they like put in their own sort of thing converge with what ASDA was doing at the time? Was it like a unique brand or did they like because it seems that's been more effective, like ASDA actually in the UK when I was there at least was doing like moderately well against Tesco. 
he said he didn't slaughter him. And so I was kind of wondering maybe their tactic there, how will they, like, how they converge when they that market would be different, as opposed to, like, Germany or... Well, most of these countries, they went in through acquisition. Certainly all the places where they've survived, they've gone in through acquisition. And again, I've really only done the detailed field work in, in Mexico. Between that and the literature, I would say that in every case, it's ended up as a hybrid. Uh, you know, and part of that is, uh, is institutional effects. Part of that is sort of, you know, just organizational inertia. That there's a certain organizational culture and so on that's, that's hard to change rapidly.